we're getting Sam Altman up, and he has a, a tight window, so we want to get right into it. Dan, welcome. Thank you. Sam, Sam, welcome to. Oh, thank you, Chip. We only have Sam for 15 minutes, so we're going to jump right into Sam. You guys want to hear from Sam? Okay, I was pretty convinced you were all here for the magician, but let's see if Sam is entertaining, because he does <laughs> do hallucinations or whatever they are. Let's go. Hey, Dan. Sam, you're here. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, yeah. Sam Altman. So as you see, Sam is in his car ready to go where he needs to go next, and it's not um, a hallucination or whatever we could say it. So um, I've had the good pleasure of knowing Sam since uh, he was 19. He was introduced to me as the smartest person this person had ever met. It turns out it might be true, until he invented something that's smarter than him. So did we, did we lose him? There he is. No, I'm here. All right, so Sam, we know you have a tight time for able, uh, table. Um, Thank you for doing this, appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk about all the check stuff later. I had the opportunity to request questions from uh, the folks here. There were a lot of them. Great. Um, I've tried to narrow it down just because of your window. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Sam is the uh, founder and CEO of OpenAI. Have anybody heard of artificial intelligence in the last <laughs> couple of months? So Sam's the actual intelligence, uh, intelligence. I'm the artificial part, so together we make <laughs> um, a little chat. So Sam, um, given the breakthroughs that you have been working on over the years, um, I just want to start right in with, with a, this question, which is, it's a three-parter. First, what should we be scared of? Second, what should we be excited about? And then third, if you were an educator, what would you be focused on now to help the next generation who's walking into the AI revolution? I think I'll, I'll go a little bit out of order there because it'll flow better. What we should be excited about is this is one of those technologies that comes along that has the ability to massively increase quality of life in ways that are hard to imagine. And I, I used to think about the world as many different technological revolutions. Now I think it's all like one big exponential. And I don't want to make too much of this moment because I think it's just something that fits in with everything else. But it is somehow a noteworthy milestone that we can now put intelligence or something that feels like intelligence into computers. You know, again, I don't want to overstate it. It's just really good software. But the software is so good now that we can do a lot of transformative things, which gets to the third part of that question. Um, one of the things that I personally find most gratifying is what is happening with education. We've seen the arc here the fastest, a three-part arc actually in education, which is initially people thought it was amazing. Um, then teachers got very nervous about what this was going to mean and what was gonna happen for take-home essays and cheating and, and a whole bunch of other serious issues. Uh, and, and now we're seeing like act three of that, where it's actually teachers that are driving forward use of chat GPT in education the most. And we hear all the time from teachers doing incredible new things in their classrooms, say they've never seen students learning so fast. Students that they really thought were struggling are now getting like personalized custom tutoring all these different ways. And it's actually been the teachers that have led to the reversals of some of the chat GPT bans in different school districts earlier um, and really just amazing innovation. And then that gets us to the, the first point you said, which is what, what, what should we be scared of? Um, the thing that I think we should be scared of is just the, the societal impact of all of this and the speed with which we have to manage through it. I'm not, I think this can totally be managed, so I don't wanna fear monger, but it is gonna be one of these periods in history where the rate of change is fast and the only way through is to embrace it. So in, in, in the spirit of that, um... The next question I have um, is a, a workforce question. So what we know are the facts up to this point, which is there are more Americans that have ever been before and there's more jobs than they've ever been before. And so technology may have eliminated some jobs, but it's created overall more jobs. Um, people are worried about that now, as you've just sort of articulated. So if you were entering the workforce today, Sam, what would you prepare yourself for, given the AI revolution is in fact here now? I, 
I think it's like very – people who make a lot of specific predictions about the way technology is going to impact thing and jobs that are going to get better or change a lot or go away, they're, they're usually wrong. So I'll try to <laughs> avoid embarrassing my future self from a few years ago now. But what I would certainly do is get as comfortable with this technology as I could, really try to develop a native-like feel for it, uh, and also prepare myself for a high rate of change in the world and, and sort of a lot of – resilience and ability to adapt to new things and learn new things quickly. One of the great things about people who are, you know, growing up with ChatGPT or getting very used to ChatGPT is that you hear again and again, like I can learn things. So new things so quickly. And I think this, you know, this ability of ChatGPT will help prepare us for this new world. So we're learning new words like prompt. Um, and yeah. you know, in, in the last 10 years, uh, there was this debate, which is, should we teach everybody STEM and should everybody be an engineer? And now it's likely that uh, engineers may be some of those areas that need to learn new capabilities. How should we be thinking about STEM, math, engineering, given the capabilities of the technology now to do some of these things for us already and probably more so in the future? I, I remember reading about other tools that have come along, the calculator being the most famous one where, you know, when the calculator came out, people said, well, what are we going to ever bother to like learn in a math class again? And, uh, you know, the industrial revolution, people say, well, what, what will humans ever do? And it turns out with better tools, we just become more ambitious. We, we, we raise the expectations on ourselves. We raise the bar for what we want. But we never run out of things to do and just say, like, all right, the world is one. We're all going to sit around and do nothing. And I have no reason to believe that will happen now. In fact, I bet quite the opposite. Do you, do you think, though, that um, uh, the move towards, I mean, five years ago, 45% of the people took engineering and STEM in college. Now it's 55%. Do you think engineering is, is the place to do it? Or would you focus on data science? Or would you focus on something else as a capability. Because when you say get familiar with the technology, you're obviously more familiar with most, but there's so much you don't know either yet. So what should somebody learn? You know, one of the nice things about this technology is the people who are best at it come from all sorts of fields. You know, the people who really know how to use ChatGPT to do amazing things are often not the engineers. I would say study whatever you want to study. I think following your own curiosity and interest and intuition works the most often for the most people. Um, I, I, I'm always nervous about taking advice, but I'm particularly nervous about taking advice about how to spend your life. So I would just, <laughs> you know, learn to learn and learn to be adaptive and things will work out. Yeah, my daughters are also reluctant to have me give them advice about how to spend their lives, but <laughs> so I think I can respect Fair enough. that. So, so Sam, let me, let me ask you one of, the, one of the bigger questions that's going around now, obviously, um, you know, there was a question for a pause, the a pause, which I think would be insane because the technology is here and someone's going to do it and better, better to be us. Um, but there's also um, ethical questions that people are going to ask that we've never really been faced with, right? It's not that something is ethical or unethical in itself as it relates to a technology, but we know the history of the world is bad people tend to do bad things faster than good people tend to do good things. Um, and so do you think, what do you think the ethical challenges are, and I know you've called for government regulation with AI, and given what we learned about the Facebook era of their, their un, I guess they were not really aware of what the possibilities could be, and I think we all experienced what they've become, some of what Mike showed earlier about you know, the way people feel about themselves. So what do you think the big ethical challenges are, and how are you and your team going about thinking them through? We spent eight months after we finished GPT-4 before we released it to the world. And in that time, we were red teaming it. We were aligning it. We were trying to make it safer. We were having external audits. We were working with public policymakers to try to find where the problems are. And it's been very gratifying that people, even people who have been very skeptical of us in the past, have said, you know, wow, OpenAI has released a more aligned, safer model than ever before. And I think that is what needs to happen. As these models get more and more powerful, we need higher standards for safety and alignment and how we're going to evaluate dangerous capabilities than, than we've had before. And the hard part of that is, as you said, not everyone is a good actor. 
And so we'll, I think, need government regulation in addition to hoping that companies always do the right thing. But, but I think we could agree that the government's um, not going to move at the pace that you or the technology or the other people in the space are going to move. And so one of the questions we got um, that I thought I would just ask is, how do you feel about different age groups interacting with AI at this point? Do you, do you have any thoughts on that um, in terms of, you know, should, should anybody at any age that has the capability start using it? Or do you have concerns over it? Or are you guys going to put in any, any you know, parental protections or anything like that on the table? Yeah, I think children should use it, you know, with permission and sort of oversight of their parents. Maybe we can make a kid mode that would be safe enough, but we don't, we certainly don't have it yet. And, and look, there's a lot you're not going to have yet. This is all so new. Um, it's very new. So I think people are just trying to get a sense, Sam, of how you think about it. I've had the good fortune to know you and know your ethics and your values, and, and you've walked me through just how much you're holding back so that the world can get used to it. So two years from now or a year it's, from now, what are, you gonna, what are we going to be shocked by? Yeah, look, well, I would say it's important to hold back, but it's also important not to hold back. There are a lot of people who would like us to or a lot of people in the AI field who would like to build AI in secret in a lab. And then once it's finished, you know, once you have a superhuman system, they would like to sort of put it out into the world all at once. And I understand why they think that's safer, but I find it terrifying. Um, I think for a world in which we all get to be part of the solution and defining what we want, the world has got to have contact with this and input and insight into what's happening so that we can have a discussion and figure out what we want the limits to be, what the good parts are, what the bad parts are. And, and so we do deploy this early. We call it iterative deployment because we want people and policymakers and our institutions to have time to, to, to wrestle with this technology because it's coming. Um, and while the stakes are relatively low and while we can still make kind of any decision we want about what to do with it, to all participate in that discussion together. So I know you're in a rush, so, so I have... It's important to hold things back, but it's also important to put things out there. Yeah, so, so a lot of the questions that we all have, and I know you have them also because you've shared them, is you're in a position to make those decisions now. And Facebook was in a, decision, in a position to make those decisions a while back. And we saw the lessons from the choices they made. I don't know who would have made different or better choices. It's easy to do it after the fact, right? So do you have... Do you have a council of advisors? Do you work, like, who at the government? How do you think about, because we're going to learn things that we didn't even know we were going to have to learn. Yeah. I mean, I try to talk to everybody. I, I am interested in talking to, like, you know, experts in government and heads of state, but I am sort of more interested in talking to the people who are impacted by this all of the time. Um, and I, I, I care about expert advice for sure, and I think it's really important. But I, I find that, like, talking to the people most impacted by technology about what's happening and what they want, that's kind of the most useful input you can get. So I try to spend a lot of my time doing that. And so just in the spirit of your time, because I know you got to go because you're already sitting in your car. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought we were starting earlier. I was really looking forward to a longer yeah. conversation. No, I was um, too. But, but hopefully the next, next year I can come back. Yeah, no, the magician was I just so good we didn't want to take him off. Um, but, Fair um, but Sam, last, last question before you go, my friend, which is... Uh, what is the thing that has surprised you the most now that you've unleashed it into the world? Honestly, how much people love it. Um, for all of the fear and anxiety, which I think is totally understandable, uh, people get way more joy and value out of the current iteration of the technology, which I think is still quite weak and primitive, uh, than I thought they would at this point. But hearing the stories about like just how much in the short number of months it's been out, it has transformed people's learning or life or work or whatever. Um, that's been a super wonderful surprise. Yeah, I think the thing that amazes me is the speed in which people have adopted it. It's the fastest product ever to have over what 150 million users, and you know our whole. I don't even know what the current number is, but it did. It has grown really fast. Yeah, no, it's insane. And so, well, listen, Sam, thank you so much for joining us and being willing to take these questions. Gratitude, my friend. Appreciate it. Thank you. Really appreciate it.